American leader owes his country more than a 24-7 circus of tweets, personal attacks, and self-celebration, don't you think? Unfortunately, the latest episode of Trump TV, what else can you call it, is all sizzle and no steak. Ask yourself, where's the beef in his meeting with the North Korean despot? The answer is, spoiler alert, Kim Jong-un agreed to let us look for the bodies of American servicemen his regime has been hiding for three quarters of a century. That's our get here. How can you not love a guy like that? What a sweetheart this guy Kim is. What a caring human being. In any case, it's apparently enough for Donald Trump. Tonight, Trump is flying home after a day of pageantry and theatrics in Singapore. This afternoon, he tweeted, got along great with Kim Jong-un, who wants to see wonderful things for his country. He also complimented the despotic uh, dictator for his great personality and called Kim funny and very smart. It was a dramatic shift, of course, from a year ago when Trump mocked him as little rocket man and threatened his country with fire and fury. Trump also praised the joint statement he signed with Kim Jong-un, calling for new relations between the two countries and a commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Let's watch. I think it's a terrific document. It's a starter, but it's a terrific document. It's they terrific. have to get rid of all their nuclear weapons. They've got to get rid of yeah, They will. I think they will. I really believe that he will. I've gotten to Did know him well in a short period of time. Yeah, sure. It's denuking. I mean, he's denuking the whole place, and he's going to start very quickly. I think he's going to start now. Well, the joint statement from the two leaders seemed to fall short of the president's own hype. As the Associated Press put it, rather than a detailed statement filled with concrete restraints on the North, the document seemed to amount mostly to a restatement of, uh, restatement of long-assumed principles and an agreement to keep talking. North Korea has promised denuclearization before, going back to a 1994 agreed framework Pyongyang sang with the United States back then. At a press conference tonight, overnight, Trump was pressed on how the United States would verify that North Korea follows through. Let's watch. We talk about the guarantees and we talk about unwavering commitment to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. This is the document that we just signed. Did you discuss with Chairman Kim methods to verify, either with the United States or international organizations, that very process? And do you yes, have we a did. Timetable yes, we did. And we'll be verifying. That to us? Yeah, we'll be verifying. It'll be How verified. How is that going to be achieved, Mr. President? Well, it's going to be achieved by having a lot of people there. It wasn't too long ago, though, that you said you defined success of this meeting by North Korea giving up its nuclear weapons. Well, that's what they're doing. Can you say why yeah. you didn't secure those details in this agreement? Because there's no time. I, I'm here one day. We're together for many hours intensively, but uh, the process is now going to take place. Well, for President Trump, a lot comes down to his newfound trust in Kim Jong-un. Let's watch that. I believe that he wants to get it done. You trust him? I do trust him, yeah. Now, will I come back to you in a year and you'll be interviewing? I'll say, gee, I made a mistake. That's always possible. Says, you know, we're dealing at a very high level. A lot of things can change. A lot of things are possible. He trusts me, I believe. I really do. I mean, he said openly, and he said it to a couple of reporters that were with him, that he knows that no other president ever could have done this. I mean, no other pre He knows the presidents. He knows who we had in front of me. He said no other president could have done this. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Wow. For more, I'm joined by New York Times Chief White House Correspondent Peter Baker. He's also an MSNBC contributor. Former governor of New Mexico, Bill Richardson, who's negotiated with the North Korean government before, Daily Beast columnist Gordon Chang, and the vice president for the National Security Program at Third Way, Mika Oyang. Let's start in this order. I want to start with Peter about the reporting here. Do we have any evidence to answer what uh, Major Garrett was asking about? Do we have any evidence that there was a worked out plan for verification of any kind or any kind of agreement along those lines? No, that's going to have to be the product of, of months of work. I mean, this is a very complicated process. The North Koreans have an estimated 141 different sites as part of their nuclear program. You can't just sort of walk in there and switch off of a, a, a switch. This is going to be a very complicated negotiation going forward. First of all, just to arrange the logistics, how would it work, what kind of time frame would it be, what kind of declaration would North Korea give so that we would have a baseline and know what we were talking about in the first place. We, we have you know, our intelligence on it, but they've never made a declaration that, we've, that the United States is considered to be satisfying. And then you have to figure out how do you verify? How do you actually know that they've done the things that they're promising to do? This is, the, this is only the beginning of the process, not the end. 
What do you have any evidence that the North Korean people, who are subject entirely to government supervision as to what they learn and dictate, have they heard anything about denuclearization? Because I just saw a, a, a wires thing that came out on their government news agency that no, never mentions it. All it does is say we've agreed to withhold our provocative, uh, irritating exercises from the from the 38th parallel. What do they have? Has, has Kim told his people he's going to denuclearize? It doesn't sound like, at least he's not emphasizing that. The report I just saw from their state television <clears throat> indicated they were emphasizing the, you know, the, the meeting itself, the fact that he had this meeting with the American president, that he was on a peer level, in effect, with the American president and didn't talk about denuclearization. The truth is, I don't know that it matters that much. It's not like he's, con <clears throat> he's worried about popular support and suddenly, you know, they're going to abandon him if he gives up the nuclear weapons. The point is, in fact, uh, that he could get more popular support if he's able to deliver on some economic benefits. That's the trade-off that Donald Trump is implicitly uh, suggesting here. He even showed a video of what a future North Korea could look like, modern and hip and, and uh, economically prosperous. That's the deal here that he's, that he's trying to get Kim Jong-un to buy into, a vision of a new North Korea that uh, is more like its southern neighbor. Let's go to Governor Richardson on this. Governor, you've been through this before uh, positively and uh, un sometimes unsuccessfully, but you've been great at the particulars of getting people out over there. Are we safer now after yesterday? Well, yes, we are safer in that uh, there's a diffusion of tension in the Korean Peninsula. South Korea is on a program of uh, bettering relations with North Korea. Japan is still very jittery because they're susceptible to their missiles. China is uh, helpful on the sanctions, but they're trying to uh, keep them, uh, they're weakening them. We are a little better off in terms of tension, in terms of uh, there's a, a movement towards normalization. The, the, the problem is that we got nothing in the area of timeline specificity and any kind of inspection regime whatsoever. Uh, the North Koreans obviously resisted. And you know, had the administration asked me, although Secretary Pompeo did call me once, I would have told him, the North Koreans always want us to go first in a negotiation. Then, then maybe they will do something. Well, we went first, we made the mistake. We said that we're gonna uh, stop some of the, suspend some of the military exercises with South Korea. I would have said, you know, do it concurrently. Don't give them something right away, especially when on the inspection issue, on the nuclear, on the mil missile negotiations, they've given us nothing. So in 60 days, if they don't have an inspection regime, if they don't have a dis specific plan for freezing and destroying uh, some of their nuclear weapons, they've got maybe 60 or their missile sites or conventional weapons, right. you know, I think uh, they got the better of the deal. Let me go to Meek on this, because what I was struck by is the fact that after this three quarters of a century since the Korean War, the, the hostilities, the actual fighting stopped, we haven't been able to get our bodies back. I mean, it's the most minimal humane thing. Let us have our bodies back of service people who were killed in that war. And now they say, oh, we'll let you go look for them about a million bucks a person. Maybe you can find some bodies here or there. This is such a small, and I would think even repellent, offer to us to say, yeah, you can go look for the bodies. Yeah, it does nothing to address the security threats to the United States. As uh, Governor Richardson said, we're not talking about the ballistic missiles that can hit the United States. We're not talking about the nuclear weapons. And, you know, allowing the United States to search for its POWs and MIAs, it's important to us, but many other countries do that. And it's not like we should have to pay for that privilege. At the same time, when Trump says, well, we're going to stop our military exercises, we're undermining our own military ready readiness for the troops who are there now and their ability to interact with the South Koreans in case of war. Well, Donald Trump, as I said, delivered a major concession suspending joint military exercises with the South Koreans. He referred to those exercises he did as provocative, the same word used by the North Koreans. He's taken their side of the rhetorical war here. Let's watch. Did you talk about pulling troops out, U.S. troops we out? We didn't discuss South that, no, but we're not going to play the war games. You know, I wanted to stop the war games. I thought they were very provocative, but I also think they're very expensive. 
Well, according to NBC, both the Pentagon and South Korea's military appeared to have been blindsided by Trump's statement, his, his concession there. And the Associated Press reported Trump's own advisors had urged him against halting the exercises. New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof wrote, Kim seems to have completely out-negotiated Trump, and it's scary that Trump doesn't seem to realize this. The cancellation of military exercises will raise questions among our allies, such as Japan, about America's commitment to those allies. Gordon, that's the question. If I were Japanese, a uh, Japanese person reading the papers today, I'd say, wait a minute, we're not even working together to keep ourselves in shape to defend ourselves against North Korea anymore. Why would we stop practicing these alerts and these uh, exercises? That would be a grave mistake because our readiness depends on these exercises, especially because we have two separate militaries working together. You know, if we can't deter North Korea, we've got to defend South Korea, and these exercises are critical to that. And so I hope that President Trump reverses that decision because that is a mistake that is going to have problems with our alliances. And Chris, you're absolutely right about the Japanese. You know, they are looking at the United States as being a selfish power here, negotiating to protect itself and not protect its ally Japan and there was no mention of the abductees the Japanese citizens who were kidnapped by North Korea there was no mention of that in the joint statement there should have been and I hope that there will be when they come up with a more definitive arrangement Peter what's this word I haul today another but these immediate 180s on the Trump front where Mike Pence is out there telling people up on the hill that uh, we're not going to stop our exercises what gives well, there was some confusion about that. Immediately after that, there was a subsequent report saying, no, he didn't say that. So I haven't gotten to the bottom of that. It is, but it does indicate how um, ad hoc this whole thing is, right? Yeah. You know, uh, if the president makes an agreement like that, usually there's some sort of preparation for it. There's a rollout plan. There's a way to inform not only the allies, who apparently seem to have been caught off guard, but your Republican uh, allies on the Hill as well, who take this stuff very seriously. That doesn't seem to have been uh, as well organized as you might have hoped it would certainly this confusion involving what the vice president set up there indicates that but it's it, that's sort of that's sort of what this uh, president uh, you know that's how he rolls right that's he's yeah. a freewheeling kind of person he's not somebody he said he didn't need to prepare for this and he would you know he would basically go off his gut uh, and that's what we're seeing well, during his press conference this morning, Donald Trump spoke about Otto Warmbier, the American college student who was imprisoned by North Korea and died shortly after returning home in a coma. Let's watch that. Otto Warmbier is a very special person, and he will be for a long time in my life. His parents are good friends of mine. I think without Otto, this would not have happened. I really think that Otto is someone who did not die in vain. I told this to his parents. Special young man, and, and I have to say, special parents, special people. Otto did not die in vain. He had a lot to do with us being here today. Well, according to Trump, the issue of human rights was discussed briefly at the summit, and Trump uh, said he thinks Kim Jong-un is committed to making change in his country. Let's watch that part. They will be doing things, and uh, I think he wants to do things. I wonder what you would say to the group of people who have no ability whatsoever to uh, hear or to see this press conference, the 100,000 North Koreans kept in a network of gulags. Have you betrayed them by legitimizing the regime in Pyongyang? No, I think I've helped them because I think things will change. Now, at a certain point, I really believe he's going to uh, do things about it. I think, they, I think they are one of the great winners today, that large group of people that you're talking about. I think ultimately they're going to be one of the great winners as a group. Governor, this is Orwellian. I mean, to talk about how they're going to be better off in the gulags because of this friendly meeting down this date that he had with the Kim uh, Jong-un, the dictator. And also, it's kind of a grotesquerie, isn't it, to say that somehow a guy who was beaten up, his brain was basically beat up, it comes back barely alive, and somehow, after the torturing of that guy, that somehow led to this summit. How do you, what does that mean, morally speaking, to say somehow he was a, I don't know how to explain why Trump would say that. Your thoughts? Well, I can I can understand uh, why he's saying that. Uh, I was involved in trying to get Otto Warmbier back, uh, my foundation, but it was the State Department that ultimately did that. 
Um, you know, the North Koreans take American prisoners and they use them as bargaining chips. But on the whole issue of human rights, it was not discussed. It barely was discussed. Not just the gulags, but issues of torture, issues. A lot of these people are starving. Uh, they don't know uh, uh, how to coexist. Uh, their agriculture, their uh, many people are jobless. Uh, if you're in the military and you're members of the elite, yeah, you're taken care of. But uh, I think at the very least, if we're going to promise economic assistance, prosperity, investment, that has to be tied in, like our foreign assistance programs, with improvements in human rights, allow access to Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the United Nations. I mean, we don't know how bad things are. I can tell you they're pretty bad, even though when I visited eight times, they keep an eye on you. They don't let you do anything. I, I once tried to get into the subway. I barely got in to see how people people are, but it's very restricted on what you're able to see, full access, unfettered access, to determine uh, how we can improve the human rights situation and, and the life of these people. This is the poorest nation on earth right. where a lot of people are starving. Well, all you have to do, anybody watch right now, is watch any of their parades, watch any time they come out in public. They look like they're automatons. The people have to smile exactly in synchronization. They have to behave totally according to what they're supposed to do in that moment. They are freakishly uh, controlled by their government as, as individual people. There is no freedom in that country. You can see it every time we get a picture of them in one of their parades. Anyway, thank you, Peter Baker. Thank you, Bill Richardson. Gordon Chang, thank you, and Mika 